thank God that we're home. Uh, we were kind of worried because we heard that it was it was very rainy while we were gone. So we were hoping that the power was on in our house and that everybody was okay. And it was so, so we thank God. And I'm going to ask you to please stand up and praise the Lord with me.
I don't know if you guys remember uh, a couple, three, four years ago, we went to Brazil on a trip with uh, Bethany and Helmer and Edwin and Maria. And it was one time that we were uh, speaking to Pastor Jonah. He's a pastor in uh, Brazil. And he says, um, we were talking and then, you know, we were, we were expressing God's love to each other. And he said, you know what, I consider you guys my friend. And then I was like, well, aren't we brothers? And then he said, well, you know what? There is a difference, he says, between being a brother and a friend. He's like, you don't choose your brothers, but you do choose your friends. So I guess when Jesus told his disciples, you know, you are my friends. Jesus had a choice to make. A lot of times, I mean, sometimes my kids don't get along, but they don't have a choice. They're brothers. They're related, right? But when we go around and we choose our friends, when we choose those people we want to love, we choose those people we want to spend our time with, I think it's very special the way that Jesus told his disciples, you are my friends. He considered them his, his friends because he had chosen them. Amen. I think it's the same when God calls us his friends. He has chosen us Amen. as friends. And we should choose him as the most endearing and closest friend because mm -hmm. he knows how to love and he knows how to take care of those that are his friends.
think that as we live our lives, there are things that the world is trying to open our eyes to. But also God is, is wanting to open our eyes. And as we were studying today, we were studying about Adam and Eve and the sin that they committed. And we study how when, they, when Adam and Eve ate from the, the fruit of the tree that was forbidden to them, it says that they learned new things. And their eyes were open to things that they had never known before. And I think that as we go through in our lives, if we let the world open our eyes, we will see things very, very different, but in, in a bad way, in a way that is not according to God's will. But if we open our, or we let God open our eyes the way we have just sung, say, God, open our eyes. He will open our eyes to the opportunities of life, to the opportunities of praising Him, to the opportunities of serving Him better. So we have a choice to make in our daily lives. Would you let the world open your eyes the way that Adam and Eve did through sin? Or would you let God be the one to open the eyes to your heart so you can follow Him closer and glorify Him each day? May the Lord add a blessing to our lives. Please be seated. Um, time for our message for on this this morning, I'm not actually going to read, but you might want to make sure that you have them down so that you can go home and read them and make sure that I'm not telling you something that is not in Scripture. I'm not. Uh, that is one of the things that I have always told people. I've been, sometimes I don't want to admit it, I've been preaching for 42 years. That's scary. Yeah. My, my, my friend Ken actually has been preaching longer than I have, but, you know, he's not here this morning, so sometimes when I stop and think about that, it's kind of scary. My first pastor was a small Methodist church way out in the country in rural Kansas that when the roads were muddy, if you didn't go through Williamsburg and come in the back way, which took a good 15 minutes longer, you might not get there because to get there you had to get to, to uh, Rosemont, that was the name of the, the not town. It was the only thing left in the town was the Rosemont United Methodist Church and the only way to get to the <coughs> Excuse me, the only way to get to the Rosemont United Methodist Church was to go off on this dirt road that went down into a deep ravine. And for those of you that think Kansas is flat, think again. And I keep having to tell my kids that. And when they go out, when we go out to Kansas, they still try to tell me it's flat. Someday I'm going to take them out to Rosemont. Because to get to Rosemont, you go out this road that looks very flat, and then it goes down in this deep ravine. And it comes back up again. Well, when it rains, the bottom of the deep ravine is actually a low water bridge. And coming up the other side is pure Kansas clay. And you don't get up the other side because it's, I am not kidding you, it is like this. You're going up, and you look up, and those old cars, you know, sometimes you couldn't see over the end of the hood if you were going up to, in, in too high of an incline. You couldn't see over the end of the hood. Well, there were days in my 64 Chevy when I couldn't see over the end of the hood, and you came to where it was going to flat out again, and all of a sudden it was just flat. It went from this to this. Well, you couldn't get up that incline when it was raining. Because your tires would spin, and I don't care how good your mud tires were, you couldn't get up that other side. You had to call the farmer that lived up on the other side of the hill and get him to bring his tractor and then wench you up that other side. I only tried that once, by the way. Two and a half years at that church, I only tried that once. And as I understand it, every pastor of the Rosemount Methodist Church has tried it at least once. But... I did. I had to get out my good Sunday, and yes, it's Sunday. I had to get out my good Sunday shoes, my Sunday suit, <clears throat> and since I'm one of these people that don't like to be late, I'm usually early, which meant 
that I would leave for church like way before. But when you come back, when you walk into the church and your and your black shiny shoes are muddy and the bottom of your trousers are muddy, there's no way that you can lie to your congregation and say, I didn't go the back way. <laughs> All right. That has given you enough time to find Nehemiah. Nehemiah sometimes is a difficult book to find. I did not... Let me see if the if yes, Pastor Dave did what I I thought he would, but I wanted to make sure. I did not make a mistake when I said eleven C, because there are three sentences in, in Nehemiah chapter uh, Nehemiah one chapter I'm sorry verse eleven. I actually only want to read the last sentence, and then. I told I, I actually didn't put the whole thing in there because it should be two two. Eleven one eleven C two two two. Alright? Now, I was the cupbearer of the king. And it came about in the month of Nisan, in the twentieth year of King Artaxerxes, that wine was before him, and I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had not been sad in his presence. So the king said to me, Why is your face sad, though you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of heart. When I see, then I was very much afraid. Let me tell you why Nehemiah was afraid. Nehemiah was afraid because you do not come before the king with a sad face on. It's not like America where you can come before President Barack Obama with a sad face or you can go to President Barack Obama and you can complain or you can go to President Barack Obama and you can say, you know what, I don't like what you're doing. Because if you went before King Artaxerxes with a sad face, he probably was not going to do anything but take his scepter and point it at you. And if he took his scepter and pointed at you, that means you're dead. So it's actually very surprising that Artaxerxes said as much as he did to Nehemiah. And it also says something about Nehemiah's relationship with Artaxerxes that he didn't just point the scepter. But he actually took the time to say, what is going on? Why do you come before my presence sad? And it's also surprising that he does that he didn't add on at the end. How dare he? There were the, the problem for Nehemiah was that God had brought it to his attention that Jerusalem was in disarray, the walls were falling down, the gates had been burned, the, places, the place of worship was severely damaged, and the people of God had walked away from his word and were not paying attention. What's the Sabbath day? I'm not asking that for you to answer, by the way. What's the Sabbath day? What are, the, what, what are the commandments of God? What are we supposed to be doing? The people were going about their business as if there was no God. And this troubled Nehemiah, because although Nehemiah was in a place of, of servitude, he was also one that was responsible, felt responsible, was called to be responsible for the children of God. There were a group of three men, and this, by the way, you, you can write this one down because I'm not actually turning there, but this is Nehemiah chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. There were three men who liked the way that Jerusalem was being handled. They liked the fact that the walls were down. They liked the fact that the, that, the, that the gates were burnt. 
And they really liked the fact that they didn't have to pay attention to what God said. Because that meant that they could have a lifestyle that was politically correct. These three men were called were Sambalat, Gabiah, and Gresham. I'm sorry, Gresham. They decided when Nehemiah came, because Artaxerxes, by the way, I, I almost left this part out, Artaxerxes let Nehemiah go back to Jerusalem. He gave him, uh, he gave him not only the responsibility of going back to Jerusalem and rebuilding the walls, he also gave him some money to do it with. He gave him the authority to do it. So when Nehemiah went back, he went back with the hand of Artaxerxes. It's, if, it's as if he went back there being the primary ruler. He was called the governor. He went back and he built these walls, and Sambalot and Tobiah and Geshen decided that they were going to call him to task, and they decided they wanted to have a meeting with them. Does this sound familiar to you? Any part of this sound familiar? You know, today, today, if you stand up for what you believe in, in, in Scripture, if you, if you stand up for what Scripture says, there's a, there are a lot of people out there who want to call you to task. There are a lot of people out there that want to tell you that you're not being politically correct because, because to be politically correct, you're not going to put the Bible first, you're going to put yourself first. Taking this a step farther and going into another, <clears throat> another religion, I was listening to the news this morning about the, uh, about the, um, what is that that's going on in London? The Olympics. I was listening to the news this morning about the Olympics. And I don't know if, if you are aware that we, that, I'm sorry, we are not entering into anything. But that the Muslims are entering into the, into Ramadan. And in Ramadan, there is a, they have to fast during the daylight hours. And they can only eat at night which is not good if you're an Olympian. And one of the things that was said on the news by one of their priests this morning, or I'm sorry, I'm not, I, I don't have the right name, but, but you know who I'm talking about, one of their religious leaders. One of the things that their religious leaders told them this morning was that if you're an Olympian, it doesn't really matter. Because you don't have to necessarily take part in Ramadan if you're an Olympian because it might ruin your health. As I was listening to that, I was thinking about the Word of God. And I was thinking about what we often get told or do tell other people when we're looking at something that might interfere. with our lives, as far as the Word of God is concerned. I thought, how can you be a good Muslim, how can you be a good Muslim and have a high holy day that, that you actually stop a war for, but it doesn't matter if you're an Olympian? And you want to know what that has to do with Christianity? Let me tell you what that has to do with Christianity. That deals with Christianity because we do very similar things. I'll be in church this Sabbath if, uh, no, let's just pick on the weather today. I'll be in church today if it doesn't rain. <laughs> I'll be in church today. Let, let me go back to Kansas. I'll be in church today if, it, if, if the low water bridge isn't covered and I don't have to drive up the, the steep hill and call, the, and call the, the farmer to come tow me out. Or if I don't have to go the long way around to get there. Now, how long do you think I would have lasted as pastor if I'd actually told them that? Because the other time that it gets bad is when it snows. You get down in that again, you can't get up the other side. Ezra, Ezra 
Ezra was the prophet of the day. And the prophet Ezra read from the word of God, Nehemiah 8, he read from the word of God, the people wept. Chapter 9, the people confessed their sins. Chapter 11, I'm sorry, chapter 13, chapter 13, beginning in verse 11, the Sabbath was restored to its rightful place. I'm only saying that, I'm only putting that piece in there because that is, that is the turn of events that were, took place in Jerusalem in that day. It's not a Sabbath sermon. But that was one of the things that came. The biggest, the biggest thing that happened with that, though, was a change of the people's heart. And an understanding that the Word of God was the preeminent spirit in their lives. They had to pay attention to the, to the law as it was written. But we're in a time of grace. We're in a time of grace. You know how often I hear that? I go home and I talk to some of my, some of my high school friends and I talk to some of the people that I went to Sunday school with and even some of the people that I had in the church in Rosemont, Kansas. And I, and I hear from them that we're in a time of grace. Why are you putting so much emphasis on the law? And... What that really tells me is they really don't know me at all. Because if you understand, because if you know where I'm coming from, you know that Jesus Christ takes first place. The Sabbath. Participation in the Sabbath. Keeping the Sabbath. Understanding the Sabbath is a blessing that is given on top of that. Jesus Christ takes first place. In the book of John, in the book of John, there are seven places that Jesus says, I am. In John 6, verse 37, he says, I am the bread of life. That means he is the one that sustains us. He is the one that keeps us going. You're not going to find that in the Old Testament. In chapter 8, verse 12, it says, I am the light of the world. In 10, verse 7, it says, I am the door of the sheep. Chapter 10, verse 11, says, I am the good shepherd. Chapter 11, verse 25, now that's an interesting one. Chapter 11, verse 25, says, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. That's an important one. Why is that an important one? That's an important one because in the Old Testament, there is a need for a blood sacrifice for our sins. God requires a blood sacrifice for sin. And if you don't have the blood sacrifice, you cannot be forgiven of your sin. Okay, got that one. You remember, uh, you remember Abram and the time that he had to take Isaac and lay him on the altar because God told him, God told him that you have to take your firstborn son and sacrifice him on the altar. And because of Abraham's faithfulness, God supplied the ram, the firstborn ram, the unblemished ram. God requires a blood sacrifice. So what is our blood sacrifice if it's not in Jesus Christ? And that's where, that's where the importance of the resurrection and the life comes in. Because Jesus Christ is our blood sacrifice. And that's the reason why we don't have to have a blood sacrifice on the altar every, every Sabbath morning. What a mess. What a mess. I, mean, I cannot imagine being a priest 
uh, I can't imagine being a Levite because I have to come in and put this blood on all this happen. Yes. And not only that, somebody has to clean up afterwards. Because the fire is not going to take care of all of it. Sorry. Somebody got to clean it up. I don't know about, I don't know how they did that because that's not, that's not give, that information is not given to us in scripture. But what I can tell you is that in, in just about every church that I've ever been a that I've ever pastored, nobody else has set up the sanctuary except Central. I didn't want you to think I didn't remember. And no, in most of the churches I've served, nobody else set up the sanctuary. Nobody else cleaned up afterwards. It was the responsibility of the pastor to take care of all of these things. Okay? Now we were blessed when we came when we came here because Pratt and Rose have always done that. Butch and Diane helped with that. I know I'm gonna leave people out, but I'm not gonna try to name everybody, but you know that there, do you know that, 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 that um, Jim and Rose come in here sometimes on Thursday night and say, no. did you know that? Yeah. Yes, I whisper. I don't want them to hear. Okay. So, looking at that and looking at having to clean up, I wouldn't want to do that. But we don't have to because Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is our blood sacrifice. He says, I am the way the truth, and the life. No one, no one enters into the kingdom except by me. That's 14.6. No one enters the kingdom except by me. So that means that you have to take Jesus Christ as your personal Savior in order to get it to, to have something after this life. And I am the true vine. 15.1. God's righteousness demands that we follow him. But this is the this is the perplexing question. This is the perplexing question. How do we know? How do we know what part of scripture is really important and what part we can take and lay over here and say, I don't really have to pay attention to that. How do we know? There's an inter there's a there's an interesting scene in uh, in a few good men. I'm, in, did anybody else in here see a few good men in, with Tom Cruise? Okay. There's an interesting scene in there where Tom Cruise has uh, Kiefer Sutherland up on the up on the witness stand, and Kiefer Sutherland has just told him that that there are two books that guide him: the Marine Corps Manual and and uh, the King James Version. Of of, of the Bible, and those are the two things that that guide him. And Kiefer Sutherland has just told Tom Cruise that when he gives an order, his men obey that order because he gave it. However, sometimes they realize that he had to give the order, but they didn't necessarily have to obey it because. They knew that he just had to give it in front of his superiors. And then there were other times that he would give an order and they could obey it or not obey it. And Tom Cruise turns to him and he says, Well, how, did you, how do your people determine what is a really important rule and which one is not? And as I look at scripture today, and I look at our society today, there are times when I have to ask that same question. How do I know which rules in this book are really important and which ones are not? Because in my ordination, I forgot how many years ago, 1983, you figure it out. In my ordination, one of the statements that I made was that this book, this book is my guide for my life and my faith. And that this book is the divine word of God and that it's inspired by God. That's what I say to my ordination. Do I believe that? If I don't, I better not say it. 
Because you know what they do to prophets, false prophets, liars. My daughter were in here, I, I forget the, her verse from Revelation. I can't. 28, Revelation 28, 12. Liars go to hell. You have to ask her for that. Okay. But that's what I said in my ordination. And if I believe that, then I also have to believe that what is said in this book, I have to follow. Matthew, these, one, these I want you to turn to with me. Matthew <laughs> chapter 5. I'm in first turn. Matthew chapter 5. A Marine Corps part. Sorry, it just happened to be there. Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 3. I'm sorry, that was 15. I am going there too. 5, beginning in verse 17 and going to verse 20. It says, Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass away from the law until it is accomplished. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and so teaches others will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. All right, do you remember what Jesus, who Jesus ragged on more than anybody else? Wasn't it the scribes and the Pharisees? Didn't he keep telling them, you're doing too much? You know, that's what my kids tell me when I tell them they have to obey the rules at school or they're out of uniform. Mr. Watt, you do too much. I don't pick on you this morning, Carlos. Carlos, you're out of uniform. Because you have on that blue shirt instead of everything black and gold. Okay? You know about my school, that's right. Carlos would come back and he said, Mr. Watt, you do too much. Okay, well, that's what he said to the scribes and Pharisees. You do too much. But right here he says, he says, he did not come. He did not come to do away with the laws of the prophets. But he did come to fulfill. Now, turn over with me to 15, chapter 15, verses 3 Verses 3 through 11. I thought I took too many days. Verses 3 to 11. He says, And why do you yourselves transgress the, com <clears throat> the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? By the way, he's now speaking to the ones who tell him he was telling them they do too much. And this is where he's saying, you do too much. Okay, listen to this. He says, And why do you yourselves transgress the commandment of, the, of God for for the sake of your tradition. For God said, Honor your father and mother, and he who speaks evil of his father and mother shall be put to death. But you say, Whoever shall say to his father and mother anything of mine you might have been helped by has been given to God. He's not to honor his father and mother, and thus you invalidate the word of God for the sake of your tradition. You hypocrites! Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain do they worship. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as their doctrines the precepts of men. And he called to himself the multitude and said to them, Hear and understand, not what enters into the mouth defiles the man, but what proceeds from the mouth, this defiles the man. These are the two things that we have to understand. <clears throat> if we're going to say that we believe that this is the Word of God, 
then we do not have the right to pick it apart and say, I'm going to take this part here, but I'm not going to take this part over here. And this part is politically correct, but please don't try to make me do this because it's not politically correct. Culture, culture does not define the Word of God. God has an unchanging spirit. God does not change His mind. Now I will, I have to say, because there are times, and because there are times written in the Old Testament, there are times that God allowed man to go his own way because man has a hard heart. We have our own designs of what we want to do and what we believe should be right. God did not want the children of Israel to have a king. Remember that? God did not want them to have a king because he said, kings are going to take you the wrong way. They're not going to tell you what I'm telling them. And what happened? What happened with Solomon? Solomon went to see a witch to tell him what to do instead of talking, instead of listening to God. That was the first king. David. How many wives did David have? And how many wives did God tell us to have? However, you know, God's kind of said, okay, y'all want all those wives? Go for But he did not put it in here that he told us to have those wives. He told Solomon not to go to see it. I'm sorry, not Solomon. Samuel. Okay. Saul. I had to look at you, Saul. <laughs> I don't want to call you Saul this morning. Saul, I'm sorry, it was Saul. Saul was the one who went to see the way. David had too many wives. His son, Solomon, had more wives than that. And he ended up turning his back on God because he thought he was too wise. God did not tell us to have kings. God told us to stick with the judges and the prophets. And when Jesus was talking to us, he said, Do not think that I came to change the law for the prophets. He didn't tell us the kings. He said the law of the prophets. Now what he told what he told the Pharisees and what he told the Sadducees and what he told the scribes is you do too much. I told you, and, I, and I'm going to put the Sabbath here because it's the most common. It's the one that, that's talked about more in scripture than anything else is the Sabbath. <clears throat> we took we took, because I'm putting us on the side of the, of the children of Israel, we took the Sabbath and we put all these encumbrances on. And we said, okay, you can't do more than travel a, a, a Sabbath day's journey. When well, you know what a Sabbath day's journey is, I guarantee you, every one of you broke the Sabbath today, if you follow that. A Sabbath day's journey is seven-tenths of a mile. That is less, I, and I'm picking on you this morning, Lydia, that is less than from my house to Lydia's house. And she lives around the corner from me. Okay? Seven-tenths of a mile, that's all you can travel on a Sabbath day. Okay? Anybody here do less than that? Thank you. We put all kinds of encumbrances on the laws that God gave us. But He gave us these laws to guide our lives. So which laws do I take and lay aside, and which ones do I pay attention to? I think that what God is telling us is that the law is written because it is something that will give us a blessing. Now, there are some laws in the Old Testament that give me pause. I can't argue that. I should be standing before you this morning with long hair and a full beard. And a robe. And, and a robe. Yeah. No, I'm sorry, the breastplate. Yeah. 
Because I don't see any place in the New Testament where God said, that's not important. I don't see it. And if it's not there, you ought to be paying attention to it, don't you think? I don't see any place in the New Testament, which is what, which is what caused me to change, to change where I was in the middle of seminary. I do not see any place in Scripture where it tells me that the Sabbath day changed from the seventh day of the week to the first day of the week. But all my friends go to church on Sunday, and if you follow script, yeah, I'm sorry, not scripture. If you follow tradition and custom back, you can go back to within 60 years of the death of Christ and find Sunday worship. But I don't see it in here. And what I do see in here is what I do see in here is that Jesus said He's not going to change anything that's in here. But it is a blessing if you follow his word. God took the Sabbath and put it on my heart as something that I had to change. What scares me, what really scares me, is that I'm afraid that someday he's going to tell me that I've got to grow a beard. I hate beards. I absolutely hate beards. And, and the longer my hair gets, the worse I like it. I mean, I got going back. I actually had long hair when I was in seminary. And well, it wasn't real long. It wasn't any more. It wasn't any longer than uh, yeah. It wasn't any longer than either one of yours. However, for me, that was long. I don't like long hair, and I certainly don't like to comb it. I'm scared to death that the day's going to come when he's going to say, "You know what? It's written here, and you better do it." Because I don't see where God ever did away with So what, going back to where we were, what part of this do we pay attention to? And what part do we toss aside because we don't want to do it? Is it a cultural thing? Is it a traditional thing? Jesus said, Jesus said, Why do you yourselves transgress the commandments of God for the sake of your own tradition? Why do you transgress the word of God because of your culture? That's in the New Testament, by the way. For those of you that want to tell me, we're under grace. We are under grace. And the fact that we don't pay attention to some of the laws in the Old Testament is, can be forgiven because Jesus Christ is our eternal sacrifice. But it doesn't make it any less valid. That is actually a... a, a, a that is actually something that I came to when I was 17 years old. And I got in huge, huge trouble. Because I, I can actually tell you where I got in trouble. We were right, the, the youth group was riding in a car going out of Valparaiso to a, to a youth fellowship meeting somewhere downstate. And I made the comment, and I made the comment in that car when my Sunday school teacher was in there and, and the youth pastor, I made the comment that the Old Testament has more validity than the New Testament. Now that's not something you want to say in a car with a bunch of people, a bunch of theologian type people, okay? And though, though I'm not saying that one has more validity than the other, because, because if you're saying the Word of God is the Word of God, you cannot put one above the other. But what you can say is that the Old Testament does not have less value in the New Testament. Right. Does not have less value. We are obligated by that. But we are also obligated to understand what God was saying when he wrote that and not what man wants to put on it. Right. And that's where we run into trouble with the Old Testament. Because too often we take the Old Testament and we say, this is what the Old Testament said, so this is my rules for it. Well, if it's not in 
the Word of God. You don't have to pay attention to it. Okay? You got that one? If it's not in the Word of God, you don't have to pay attention to it. And by the way, the Sabbath journey was not in the Word of God. It was in that other rule book that the Pharisees had. With those, how many, I wish Pastor Dave was actually here this morning because I would have, he, he knows the number of rules they had on the Sabbath that I cannot even remember. Oh, yeah. Too many. Those rules are not in Scripture. They're in the other book. When your heart, when you hear the Word of God, does it make you weak? If it is not backed, if what you are doing is not backed by the Word of God, it is not done. It's the Word of God, not the Word of the Apostles, not the Word of some, of some preacher. It is the Word of God that should be guiding your life. And if it's not in the Word of God, don't have to pay attention to it. Turn to, uh, let's stand together and turn to number four. How great thou art is our closing hymn, number four. Didn't give you any warning this morning, did I, Sherry? Sure. Yeah. <laughs>